Um, welcome to this Changing Planet seminar uh, organised by the Grantham Institute here at Imperial College London. Uh, if you'd like to keep up to date with future Grantham news and events, uh, you can do so using the links that we posted in the chat below. Uh, my name is Ben Chappell. I'm a PhD student here at Imperial and I will be chairing today's event. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, we do encourage participants to join with their cameras on, um, but please ensure you keep your audio muted at all times, especially during the speaker's presentation. Uh, we are honoured to be joined this afternoon uh, by Joyce Msuya, uh, Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and Deputy Executive Director of the UN Environment Programme. Uh, a microbiologist from Tanzania, uh, Ms. Msuya began her career at the World Bank as a public health specialist for Africa in 1998 and now has more than 20 years of experience in international development strategy, operations, knowledge management and partnerships across Africa, Asia and Latin America. She has held a series of high level positions at the World Bank Group, including the World Bank Institute's East Asia and Pacific Regional Coordinator in China, Principal Strategy Officer at the International Finance Corporation and Special Advisor to Lord Nicholas Stern, World Bank Senior Vice President and Chief Economist. Between November 2018 and June 2019, Ms. Msuya served as Interim Executive Director at the UN Environment Programme, overseeing UNEP's portfolio in 33 countries and administering nine multilateral environmental agreements on critical environmental issues. The University of Strathclyde, where she was an undergraduate, named her their Alumna of the Year for 2019. Now, Joyce will speak, I think, for approximately 20 minutes, um, after which we will open the floor to questions from the audience. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, please write it in the chat as we go along, including your name and affiliation, if possible. Uh, when we come to the Q&A, I will call on you to unmute yourself before you ask your question. Um, but if you would prefer for me to read it out on your behalf, uh, please also make that clear. And finally, please note that this session is being recorded. I will now hand over to Joyce Suya for her talk uh, on fairy tales of economic growth, reimagining a, a sustainable economy. Uh, Joyce, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, yeah. Okay, just one minute. Um, so I am very delighted uh, to be speaking to you all. Uh, let me start by thanking uh, ben for moderating uh, this session, but also my deepest thanks to Professor Martin Siegert, Director of Gratham Institute for Climate Change and the Environment. Uh, I am delighted to be here to speak about a topic that is so close to my heart. As Ben uh, noted in his very kind introduction early on in my career, I had a privilege of working with Lord Nicholas Stern when he was the chief economist at the World Bank Group. And ever since then, economics has been a subject that has shaped how I see the world, even though I was trained as a microbiologist. But what I'm really speaking about today goes deeper than economics. It cuts to the heart of one of the greatest challenges of our time. It's a challenge that can be summed up by a question. And the question is, how can humankind flourish for generations to come without laying waste to the living world that sustains all of us? Answering this requires us to look at the story that mainstream economics has told us about who we are as human beings. Economists like to paint people as rational, solitary actors who are motivated primarily by competition. We are told we are calculating, greedy, and dominant over nature. As far as Adam Smith, Economists have encouraged us to pursue our own self-interest because this, they say, is what best serves individual and collective well-being. This view of humanity is central to modern economics and indeed the modern world. But how true is it 
Well, we now know that it's only half the picture. The Nobel Prize winning economist Daniel Kahneman was famous for showing that humans have an amazing ability to act completely irrationally. Nor are we entirely selfish and competitive. Our capacity for love, altruism, and cooperation is etched into our DNA. So the economic system we've built is based on a very limited and limiting definition of what it means to be human, because our economies encourage consumption and novelty-seeking behavior. We have created societies that value profit, material wealth, and economic expansion above all else. What has this led to? Well, in rich, high-income nations, and when I talk about the problems of economic growth, I'm talking specifically about high-income countries. There are serious signs of social and cultural decay. Even before the pandemic, the OECD was warning of an epidemic of loneliness in the West. Trust in the government continues to decrease while the gap between rich and poor grows, it says. The West has built economies where most people's living standards are no longer rising and where the fruits of economic expansion are increasingly grabbed by those who already have the most. This is trickle-up economics, not trickle-down. And then we have the climate crisis and the destruction of the living world. Our studies are clear. A linear fossil fuel-based model of economic growth that relies on unsustainable levels of consumption and production is destroying the ecological building blocks on which our well-being depends. We face a planetary, a triple planetary crisis of climate, nature, and pollution. Our air, water, and soil are contaminated. And we've also seen what the consumption and production of more and more stuff has caused. Let me cite some examples. Plastic pollution in our oceans has increased tenfold since 1980. Up to 400 million tons of heavy metals, solvents, toxic sludge, and other industrial wastes enter the world's waters every day, every year. The devastating irony is that despite these horrific side effects, economies have to keep expanding to prevent the system from collapsing. In doing so, we end up consuming more resources and causing even greater ecological harm. This is the, this is the dilemma of growth. So what can we do about all this? Before I answer, I want to point out again that when I say we, I'm really talking about high income countries. It's the world's richest countries that are responsible for most of the harm that we see today. The wealthiest 1% produce double the combined carbon emissions of the poorest 50% one of our recent reports found. And the G20 account for 78% of all global emissions. These countries have a responsibility to question the thinking and systems that led us to this point so that they can begin to transform their economies in a way that gets us out. But how? First, they will need to stop using economic growth as a measure of human well being. As Partha Dasgupta, one of the world's leading economists, says, GDP is, and I quote, based on a faulty application of economics, end of quote, that fails to account for the damage done to the biosphere. Even its architects knew that GDP was a poor measure of human progress, and yet GDP growth has been the primary indicator of our success as a species for decades. 
Dr. Akinumi Adesina, president of the Africa Development Bank Group, puts it more bluntly. I quote, nobody breathes or eats GDP. When we measure wealth properly, taking nature into account, we will be better custodians of the planet. End of quote, he says. I'll come on how we can measure wealth properly in a moment, but I want to make something clear. When we talk about discarding GDP as a measure of progress, we are not talking about degrowing our economies. The debate about whether we need to grow or shrink economies is a false one, I would argue. Instead, rich countries must aim to move beyond growth. This means sectors that fail to enhance prosperity will need to shrink. Those that increase well-being will need to grow. One obvious sector to degrow is the fossil fuel industry. Despite what orthodox economists want us to think, markets are not efficient. The invisible hand is not so invisible. The massive government subsidies to the fossil fuel sector are a case in point. They allow polluters to continue to artificially claim value and growth at the expense of the environment and social well-being. And then there are countries that will need to continue to grow their economies, those whose incomes are so low that they fail to meet basic needs and suffer from underconsumption. So how can rich nations begin to measure wealth properly? First, they must put nature at the heart of their economies. This means recognizing that the living world is our most precious asset, a concept that lies at the center of what we mean by natural capital and inclusive wealth. Unless economists begin to value our air, our soil, our waters, a stable climate, the richness of the living world, the very things that make life possible, then the destruction of the living world will continue. Second, we need to redefine what we mean by wealth. In the economies of tomorrow, wealth must become synonymous with human well being. Do our lives have more or less meaning? Do people have access to things that they care most about family, health, the natural environment, meaningful work? And are these being achieved within planetary boundaries? Alternative ways of measuring this progress exist. The Genuine Progress Indicator or the Inclusive Wealth Index take into account the health of the living world. New Zealand's Living Framework uses 38 indicators to measure progress in 12 areas of well being, like housing, health, the environment, and culture. Adopting the UN system of universal accounting, which accounts for national stocks of forests, clean water, arable land, and other natural capital. Scotland, Iceland, and, the New, and New Zealand are just a few examples of high income countries that are making this shift to a well being economy. We are also seeing cities in countries like Canada and the Netherlands shift to more secular regenerative economies. Among non-OECD countries, Costa Rica is a superb example of what middle-income countries can achieve. It has high level of well-being despite a relatively low GDP, and it has achieved this without damaging the natural world. It now outscores the United States on life expectancy, democracy, and how its people evaluate their lives. And it's the only tropical country in the world to have reversed deforestation. If we are going to respond to the climate and ecological crisis in a way that stops the worst harm, then more of the world's wealthy nations will have to follow suit. This is where the interface between science and policy is so vital. 
Science informs policy. It can tell us where scarcity lies, atmospheric carbon, nutrient overloading, the contamination of oceans in a way that markets and flawed pricing mechanisms can never do. Equipped with this knowledge, governments can leapfrog the lags that are built into markets by enacting forward-thinking policies. Science, in other words, lets us get ahead of the problem rather than waiting for the markets to respond. So this is the task we have before us. If we are going to transform our relationship with the living world in a way that allows human to flourish within planetary boundaries, then we will need to re-examine how our economies function, what we value, and, what, and how we measure progress. We will need to restructure our economies so that they are circular and regenerative instead of linear and extractive. And we will need to harness the full power of science to trigger this transformation by presenting policymakers with ways to get out in front of the problem. As the intellectual architects of our future, you have the power to illuminate our uncertain future and in doing so, shape our future in a way that allows our descendants to flourish. There is really no greater task. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Joyce. That was fascinating. Um, definitely a sort of timely call to arms, I would say. Um, so we, we will move into a Q&A now. Um, as I mentioned before, if anyone does want to ask a question, please do put it in the chat um, and I will call on you in turn to unmute yourself um, and ask your question. Um, I will, I think we'll just, um, I'm sure some will be coming in a moment. I might start things off with a question that's sort of relevant to actually my own area of research, which looks at the future role of tourism in supporting conservation, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it, obviously tourism is a pretty significant contributor to the economies of lots of sub-Saharan African countries. Um, uh, and it supports sort of conservation, the conservation of landscapes that might otherwise be under pressure to be, to, to be um, converted to other forms of land use, which obviously have severe sort of biodiversity um, consequences. And yet sort of long haul tourism is obviously very, um, damaging to the environment contributes significantly to climate change do you do you think that that's the sort of that's the sort of um sector of the economy that really has to it should have no future role in supporting conservation or is there or do you think it's sort of necessary part of the uh, of the solution in the future uh thanks ben i mean it's a very good question and especially for someone uh, like me who is currently based in kenya where the tourism sector is a core part of Kenya's uh, economy. I, would, I don't see it as either or. I mean, if I take a very specific example in the Eastern Africa zone, still work in progress. For example, we are seeing um, in certain countries where conservation um, uh, policies have been put in place and actually that has been sold as a value proposition for the tourism sector. I'm thinking of countries like Rwanda and what they've done with gorilla and the uh, tropical forests that have been uh, preserved. Uh, it's a similar story here in Kenya. If you go to some of the conservation conservancies in uh, Masai Mara, for example, uh, there are certain very strict restrictions in terms of actually trying to balance the conservation, the tourism revenue, as well as the uh, environmental damage. We are also seeing uh, more and more um, edu education and advocacy. For example, if you look at the Maasai community, uh, a number of governments now have education opportunities and um, training. Uh, at the community level to actually balancing the two. So I think for me, a more interesting question is how can uh, tools such as technological uh, tools, chips that can be um, uh, inserted in trees uh, play a role in actually protecting forests? Uh, how can we use science and data to help inform policymakers so they can put in place the right policy options to balance the two. 
So that would be my response. Over to you. That's great. No, thank you. That's, that's a really interesting response. This gives, gives me lots of things to think about for my, um, my project, for sure. Um, great. So we've got um, a first question from the audience. Um, so it's from uh, Krista uh, Haltunen. Uh, Krista, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, sure. Yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really, really interesting and really persuasive. Uh, my question is about what can we as kind of young academics, PhD students do to advance these arguments? So my experience of discussing topics like getting rid of the GDP measure is that if you're discussing with people who are kind of more established than me or have an economic or business background, often the answer is something like, you just don't understand simple economics, you're naive. I don't agree with that, but I'm just wondering if you have any tips for what, what to say in these situations or what we could do. That's a very good question, uh, Krista. So I'll give you um, uh, three proposals for your consideration. I mean, I having worked at the World Bank Group for two decades, I absolutely understand the context in which you have set your question very well. But I would also say the external world and the expectations, including from young people on climate, on natural uh, capital, uh, as assets is really evolving. If I compare when I started my career uh, more than 25 years ago, the knowledge on uh, uh, natural assets is not where it is today. So what can you do? I think one is using, for example, some of the uh, uh, metrics uh, that I have shared with you, including what we have developed in the UN system, but also equally, if not more important, uh, um, examples from New Zealand and from other countries that are experimenting with some of these things to actually demonstrate what is possible. Two, I find most of the policymakers, including and ministries of finance and planning, they like data. So what can you do as a PhD academician is actually raising the interconnectedness of the natural world assets plus the GDP. And as I have said in my remarks, we are not uh, championing for uh, no growth. It's just growth plus the human being natural capital aspect. So bringing those up to policymakers through your thesis, through your areas of study, et cetera. And lastly, highlighting examples from other countries. Most, every country is different. The context is different. The dynamics are different. But if you say a country X has experimented uh, with these types of measures and they're making progress and now there are different rankings, you know, happiness and well-being. If you look at Costa Rica as an example, then it's, it does bring a certain momentum amongst countries. So those are the three specific areas that I, I would highly recommend. And lastly, I would say speak up, but speak up with substance. Uh, data and whatever areas of research findings that you have. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was a great question. And thank you for your answer, Joyce. And um, our next question was from, from Max. Um, Max, I'm not sure whether you'd like to, um, I think part of your question may have been answered just now by Joyce, but would, would you like to unmute yourself and add anything? No, I think we will move on in that case to the next question, um, which is from uh, Holly Falker Tapp, who is um, a PhD student here at Imperial. Um, Holly, would you like to unmute yourself, please? Thank you so much for that talk. Uh, particularly interesting is putting nature at the heart of the economy. Uh, do you see initiatives such as carbon offsetting or biodiversity crediting as being a good step towards valuing natural capital or do you think that they offer an excuse to maintain business as usual for as long as possible? Uh, I think a short uh, response, uh, thank you, Holly, would be, I see them as promising, but probably more work needs to be done. Uh, that is the short answer. I think um, the uh, offsetting knowledge is still evolving and it varies. Um, I follow it up, but I see mixed uh, uh, reviews of it. So I do see them as potential opportunities, uh, but definitely more work to be done. I wouldn't um, 
rule out everything at this particular moment. Uh, as I've mentioned in my remarks, uh, the urgency, the cost of inaction is higher than action. Uh, but of course, we have to be informed by science and data to actually come up with the right policy options. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Holly. Um, our next question is from Geraint Northwood, who is also um, a PhD student here at Imperial. Um, thanks, Geraint. Would you like to unmute yourself? Hi, uh, hope you can hear me. Um, uh, yeah, thank you for your talk. And um, it's really good to hear these things being talked about, especially um, from the UN. Um, I, I basically wanted to ask, um, because uh, environmental accounting and triple bottom line and things like this that are alternatives to um, sort of GDP and, and profits are, uh, can often be sort of greenwashing exercises, especially for businesses. Um, and they don't really change the sort of fundamental profit motivation of the C-suite and their obligation to shareholders. So um, my question is, do you think that you know, these measures um, are more effective for governments rather than businesses? Um, and if they are effective for businesses, or you know, with regard to businesses, do we not have to change those fundamental power relations first? Thank you. Geraint, I think, uh, I don't know if I mispronounced your name, apologies if I did. So it's a very interesting question, which you, as you can imagine, we get all the time here in UNEP, uh, be, being uh, the highest global environment authority, working with governments, but also other stakeholders, the kinds of questions that you have raised, it's, is it e either government or business um, comes up all the time. But let's break it down. For example, if you look at one of our flagship publications, the Global Environment Outlook number six, which came out in 2019, I believe, what our scientific data demonstrated is that if we are to make, for example, any uh, uh, progress when it comes to the three planetary crises, climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution uh, chemicals, we do need what the report called systemic transformations. So take the agriculture sector, for example, which is dominant in a number of countries, developed and developing, and look for the entire supply chain. Depending on the country, you do have both the governments and especially businesses when it comes, for example, to big uh, plantations uh, or uh, production lines that are involved. So if you talk, if we look very carefully, how do, you, do we advise governments as a UN agency, but also others, how do we make a difference when it comes to the agriculture sector? It could be uh, the use of inputs, for example, fertilizers and or water efficiencies, depending on the challenges, the private sector has to be part of the story. I think a more interesting question is how can these types or how can, in our case, UN look at working with uh, business associations through, for example, we have the UN Global Compact, uh, which is an entity that is working with the private sector to actually discuss and see how each stakeholder government, business, but also civil society and other in indigenous communities, for example, in Latin America, can play a role. Uh, so one is to use global multi-stakeholder platforms to actually put the issues on the table. And the issues will vary from one sector to another. So we believe in collective action. Uh, we do not believe in greenwashing and we are very mindful of that. And therefore we use science to actually help uh, the business community as well, including the GO6 or the emissions gap report to talk about their role, uh, but as uh, informed by science. So I don't look at it as either or, because I think environmental issues are everybody's business. And I gave you an example of the agriculture sector um, to demonstrate that. Over to you, Ben. Thank you. 
Thank you, Joyce, and thank you, Geraint, for that, for that question. It was great. Um, our next question um, is from uh, Emma Burns, who is also a PhD student here at Imperial. Um, Emma, could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of my question was just answered, but I suppose I was kind of looking for more of a, um, a, a kind of different approach. So what we often hear from these companies, particularly manufacturers, is if we put environmental regulations on them, they will then just switch their production to different countries where these restrictions don't exist. And, um, you know, this can apply to manufacturing or financial uh, systems. So like using countries as tax havens. So what kind of loopholes would you say are some of the most difficult to close in order to get businesses who are reluctant to cooperate to cooperate. Thank you, Anna, I think your name was. What kind of loopholes? You know, uh, it's a very interesting question. About two weeks ago, I was invited to speak to a group of businesses from the US and there was a heavy presence of financial sector. Uh, including asset management companies. And for me, it was very interesting listening to them. They were particularly interested in two things. One was, are there uh, examples of sustainable financing businesses that have worked in other parts of the world, for example, in asset management that they could learn from? And the take home message for me was, we need to share more examples I cited a number of countries in my speech of countries or businesses that have worked because that demonstration effect is quite powerful, especially when it comes to businesses, to businesses engagement. Two, um, there, were, there was quite a lot of interest from manufacturing, uh, but also financial sector on principles of sustainable banking because most of these businesses depend on loans and other type of financial arrangements. And there were questions and interest about how they can raise the bar. So what are the loopholes? I, I would say actually the opportunities is how can policymakers, if you look at some of the countries that have the manufacturing um, uh, capacity or businesses that are trying to follow sustainable practices, for example, in cement manufacturing, there is also the right policy instruments and options that have been put forward at the country level that actually promote sustainable uh, practices. How have this been developed? Usually from what I have seen is through government business associations and regular engagement. Two is provision of data. Uh, for example, here in Kenya, when they banned uh, the use of um, single uh, plastic bags, I think it was 2016, there was a lot of uh, uh, conversations and consultations between the government and the plastic manufacturing manufacturers in Kenya, and there were quite a lot in terms of looking for alternative opportunities within the manufacturing space. Uh, two, on the retraining of some of the um, uh, laborers, because the real concern was around job losses. And that's where, again, the government came in to play, to talk to the manufacturer, manufacturers association around the plastic industry. So I think a more interesting question is actually looking at what are the policy options, but also do a thorough assessment to see where are the trade-offs and opportunity cost, and how can the government come in to try and help fill in some of those? Um, and then the second, particularly in the manufacturing sector, is seeing how technology, whether it's AI or digital transformation, can actually leapfrog some of the gaps that may exist if one follows the normal uh, growth pattern. Over to you, Ben. Great. Thank you very much for your, um, your question, Emma, and um, for that really fascinating answer, Joyce. Thank you. Um, so our next question is from, is from Gina Charnley, um, who's also a PhD student here at Imperial. Um, she's asked me to, to read it out for her. 
Um, she says, thanks for your talk. Um, I like the way you got across the messages about GDP and growth. It was very accessible to non-economists. Um, for low and middle income countries who are aiming to increase their national wealth and improve livelihoods, um, how do you discourage nations who want to follow on the path that high income countries have to follow these new paths that are less damaging to the environment? Thank you, Regina. And, uh, you know, as a non-economist myself who happened to have worked with very uh, stellar economists, I, I can relate to you. I try to be as simple as I can because that's how I learned from uh, former supervisors like Lord Nicholas Stern. So very much appreciate. On your question, uh, what um, can low and middle income countries learn, et cetera? Uh, I would offer two proposals. You know, I, I worked for the World Bank Group in South Korea. Uh, and if you look at South Korea around the history, around 1967 or so, South Korea had the same per capita income as Ghana and Tanzania then. And one of the exciting work program that the World Bank Group had in South Korea when I was there from 2014 to 17 was actually to try and learn from the uh, development journey of a country like South Korea, uh, because it became an OECD country and a dark donor, uh, how did they transform their economy, the good and the bad lessons? And we did a very interesting case study, which actually helped inform low uh, income countries, was the story of fossil fuels and industrialization phase of South Korea. So to answer your question, how can low income countries um, uh, learn or not take the same journey? One is to learn from these countries. If you look at London uh, in a uh, long, long time ago, the fossil fuel story was dominant. So actually learning and packaging those lessons like what we did uh, in my previous job from South Korea and share with other policymakers how they did it, what did they learn from it, et cetera. Two, for a number of countries, we are seeing uh, renewable energy uh, costs are going down. Uh, for example, one of our programs in uh, UNEP is actually playing a convening role uh, for solar energy entrepreneurs. And one of the last uh, events that I attended in Rwanda was actually bringing solar entrepreneurs from India who had done renewable energy businesses at a massive scale to come and meet with potential African entrepreneurs that were interested in not only learning about the technology, but also buying some of this technology. So one is the cost of renewable energy uh, is going down and there are some entrepreneurial uh, opportunities which also create jobs and therefore contribute to uh, economic growth of low income. I think the, the third is I see, for example, in a number of countries in low, low income countries, the government is actually incentivizing um, uh, citizens to use uh, renewable energy, just like in developed countries when electric cars, for example, were started, there was a bit of incentives, whether it's through tax relief or a tad of subsidies to promote usage of cleaner uh, source of energy. So those are the three ideas that I would put forward. Thank you. That's great. And thank you so much for your, for your question, Gina. Um, right, so the next question we've got is from uh, Ruben Nixon Hill, who is a, a fellow PhD student here at Imperial again. Um, Ruben, would you like to unmute yourself, please? Yeah. Hi, Joyce. Thank you for your talk. Um, I think there are there are many compelling reasons uh, to adjust our measures of, of wealth and, and progress. Um, but I guess if I if I listen to the news every day, I still typically the figures are, you know, the latest GDP figures are out been published by the Treasury. And I, and I was just wondering kind of from your point of view, where are we in this discussion internationally? And who are the key actors who still need to kind of be persuaded to enact change in how we do these measurements? And, and then what policies are made in response to those? 
and like is there some particular is there like one particular actor or partic who if they if they change tack then all the dominoes would fall and everyone else would do the same thing or particular sectors of of industry or thank you ruben uh a uh, good question. Is there one particular actor? Not one, but there is a group of uh, actors that uh, we think uh, could actually uh, make a difference. I would argue G20, uh, given the political clout, given if you uh, aggregate the economies of the G20, it's quite a significant chunk globally and uh, uh, the leadership as well of G20, considering uh, the largest emitters are included in that group would send a very, very uh, positive uh, signal, but also uh, leadership. Uh, where are we? I would say we are not where we should be. Our Secretary General has stopped uh, quite passionately, we just released uh, a couple of months ago a report making peace with nature that again gives the scientific evidence of where we are. So we are not where we should be. And in fact, if you add the sustainable development goals timeline, um, you know, we are hardly 10 years away. So it's a question of speeding up the pace uh, but I'm very optimistic. I mean, I am an eternal optimist by nature. If you look at uh, the current political economy, uh, just last week, uh, the US administration had the leader summit on climate, uh, bringing the heads of states, and that gives me hope. Uh, I think the UK has a big role to play as part of the presidency for COP26 coming up in Glasgow. Uh, but also if you look at this year, for example, we have the uh, COP on biodiversity to be hosted by China. So on one hand, you have the UK driving uh, the climate change COP. You have China driving the biodiversity and actually countries are expected to uh, sign up and uh, the, on the post-2020 biodiversity framework. So I think it will take collective action, uh, but also in the global south, I mentioned Costa Rica. They are quite active if you look at the Latin America and the Caribbean region in actually pushing the region. Uh, but I would still argue there are opportunities to make a difference at every level, including at community level. Some of the uh, progress, actually, you're seeing them in indigenous communities, say in Latin America, when it comes to conservation, uh, civil society, NGOs, they have a key role to play uh, when it comes to the three planetary crises. So, but I would, as I've made an argument in my uh, speech, uh, OECD countries, particularly G20, have a key role to play. Thanks. Thank you, Ruben. That was a great question. And again, a really interesting, thought-provoking answer. Thank you, Joyce. Um, our next question now is from uh, Yamu Kikstra, who is another PhD student here at Imperial. Um, if you'd like to unmute yourself, please. Yeah, yeah, super interesting talk and very wide-ranging uh, topics. So my question is another one, I think, on communication, but also um, terminology used in, in research itself. Um, so you mentioned very clearly that the goal is not to degrow, um, blindly degrow all sectors, but rather to move beyond it and focus on different sectors and different national contexts. Um, in my understanding, this is also how the research body of degrowth usually tackles uh, the problem. So my question would be, would you advise us not to use degrowth for conveying this same message of, of focusing on degrowing only some, some sectors and, and only some countries? So, so is the term as like a, a system critique of, of economic growth and, and these fairy tales, is that overshadowed by it being misinterpreted as blind reduction of GDP? One, I would not, uh, look, I cannot speak about this uh, uh, terminology that is being used by another entity. I think the fundamental ideas put forward here is to uh, 
not saying growing uh, economies is a bad idea. What we are arguing is even better is actually to factor in the natural assets. So to have a more comprehensive account of the economies plus. Uh, I also think given the uh, public movement and increased awareness of climate change issues, we are seeing youth movement, communities movement. Uh, it's also a people-centric communication that does not exclude environment, the well-being plus the economies. Um, so we're not saying don't grow, no, because growth also brings quite uh, significant uh, benefits from uh, uh, safety nets, service provision to jobs creation, but it's more taking a more holistic uh, view of growth, including natural assets. That's what uh, we, were push we are pushing for. Over to you. Thank you, Yana. That was great. Um, perfect. So our next question then is from Graham Brand, who is from the Robert Owen Community Banking Fund. Um, Graham, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question, please? All right. Thanks. Thanks. That's really interesting. Just to community banking, community development, fine institution. Sorry, Graham. I think I think you're. you're sorry, Graham. I think you're breaking up quite quite Hello? considerably. Um, I I can't hear you. I, I'm I'm not sure if it's the same for everyone else. I can't really hear. I, I, what I might do is I might read out your question for you, if that's all right. Um, I will. Um, I'll just do that. Do that now. Um, so Graham's question was: At present, money is created by banks. Sorry, one second. Um, at present, money is created by banks as interest-bearing debt, which it is argued leads to ever-increasing money supply. This system therefore becomes unsustainable in the absence of continuous economic growth. Do you agree with this view? And would a money creation system based on a mutual credit model, as advocated by Tom Greco and others, be more sustainable? Thank you very much, Graham. I mean, the short answer is, uh... I don't believe I'm equipped enough to answer the uh, the technical question on the banking and whether I agree or not. Uh, having been trained as a scientist, I want to do a little bit of research before responding to give an affirmative position. So that would be uh, my uh, my. Uh, but I I didn't understand whether you were referring to it's only the banks through the interest. Uh, they do make profits. I, I, I missed that part, sorry. Graham? Um, or... is, am I still breaking up or shall I type something? No, so I it's, could hear it's you. It's better now. It's better now, yeah. Uh, I'm in rural Wales and the internet is pretty bad here. Um, the mutual credit system is like uh, local exchange trading schemes, which were popular in the 1990s, if you're familiar with that. Um, probably one of the most successful schemes uh, is Sardex in Sardinia. There's, there's lots of stuff on, on the web about that if you Google Sardex. Um, we're trying to set up a mutual credit system here in Wales. Um, my argument is that the way that money is created by banks through the fractional reserve system, it's forever creating more money which goes into circulation. Uh, there has to be economic growth to, uh, there's never enough money to pay back the interest on top of the capital without continuous economic growth. And my understanding of classical economics is if money supply increases, you have to have economic growth or you have inflation. Um, I'm very interested in the mutual credit model. Perhaps, you know, if you have a look at that, if you haven't come across it before, I find it very interesting. Um, and the whole question of what is money? Money, we treat it as a commodity, as though it were like iron ore or, or grain. It's traded. Well, what is money? It isn't a commodity at all. It's, it's a unit of measure of the value of economic transactions, in my view. 
Um, so yeah, th there is um, there is a Wikipedia entry for mutual credit as well. So I appreciate if if it's a new concept to you, it, it takes a while to get it across. I have great difficulty trying to talk to people about this because they don't understand what I mean by mutual credit. But uh, I think it's worth considering this whole question of what is money um, and how we develop a sustainable uh, money supply for a sustainable economy. Thank you very much. So I would definitely join uh, the group of uh, people you spoke to, Graham, that are not very familiar with mutual credit uh, model. Uh, but as a lifelong student, I am more than happy to learn more about it. And then uh, we can have a discussion when I'm a little bit uh, uh, more educated in this particular uh, model. Uh, but I will check out the Wikipedia page that you mentioned and other resources. So thank you very much for, for raising this. Over to you, Ben. Yeah, probably the best one is Sardex. If I think that the Sardex, they've got a little video that explains it quite well. That's great. Thank you very much, Graham. Yeah, I'll I'll certainly be um be looking into that myself. It does sound sounds interesting. Um, great. So our next question then is from Sahir Khan, who is an Imperial alumnus um, who studied computational methods uh, for aeronautics here at Imperial. Um, would you like to unmute yourself, please? Hi. Hi Joyce, um, I'm also calling from Kenya at the moment, uh, so I'm very interested in in uh, some of these things that you've mentioned about initiatives in Kenya. Uh, you know, with an engineering background, uh, I'm trying to do my part uh, for uh, uh, sustainability in East Africa. So I just want to ask if you know of any interesting uh, initiatives that really connect technology and data with informing uh, policy in East Africa, and particularly ones that deal with the realities of, uh, of the rapid development uh, and urbanization uh, that, that's going on. So rapid socioeconomic changes that uh, result in a lot of uh, issues and uh, conflicts between wildlife and, and uh, biodiversity in general. Thank you, Sahir. Good to know that you are just in, uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, so, um, regarding tech and data, one, if, frankly, if I look at uh, Eastern and Southern Africa, you are in the right place in terms of the IT infrastructure, uh, real commitment and will from not only the Kenyan government, but if you look at the East African community through the environmental lens, they actually are looking at sub-regional uh, type of collaboration and that provides scale. Uh, on data, you have quite a strong human capital uh, in the area where you are in Kenya, but also uh, in some countries around uh, Kenya. So uh, do I know of specific initiatives between tech and data? I am aware of a couple. We can follow up offline uh, looking at big data and trying to see how the big data agenda could actually help inform uh, sub-regional uh, environmental policy options. Uh, and most of these are done by think tanks here at the African Economic Research Consortium in Nairobi uh, was running one. I think two, there are some very interesting entrepreneurs, part of our United Nations Environment Assembly uh, meeting, which happens once every two years. There are booths uh, for stakeholders, including private sector, science policy business forum, we call it, where they come and actually demonstrate what they're doing. And building on the M-PESA platform, for example, uh, I've seen some very interesting initiatives to look at how do you sort of do an M-PESA type for um, meaningful agriculture, uh, private sector solutions, but using data that is linked to uh, usage uh, of um, uh, uh, cell phones, for example. So I'll be happy if you get in touch with Ben through my office, I can connect you with uh, uh, some of these uh, contacts. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. It's so nice to hear that such exciting stuff is happening in East Africa. So it's very encouraging. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you for the question. And again, thank you. Thank you for that answer. And yeah, we'd be very happy to, if you get in touch with me, I'll be happy to make the connection. Um, great. So we have another question now from uh, Robin Lamble, who is a professor here at Imperial. Um, Robin, please go ahead. 
I'm not actually a professor, but okay, um, I'm just a postdoc. Um, yeah, just asking about different metrics that you could use. Um, so like there are lots of these suggested like green growth or well-being metrics, um, but when I actually try and find data for them, they're all quite scattered and small and only like a few institutes are really reporting them. Which would you prioritize if I were to look uh, at something to replace GDP as like my go-to statistic or which two or three would you prioritize? That's a, uh, Robin, thanks. That's a, uh, a good question. I mean, I think uh, given that I am uh, from the UN, I would definitely, uh, um, there is, by the way, a, a report, we can uh, send you a link, but I would definitely uh, vouch for the natural capital, uh, but also the UN system of universal accounting, uh, which has been vetted and is uh, scientifically based. So those are the two, but context matters. So I think there are other nuances that one has to look at in addition to just uh, going with one metric. Thanks. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Robin. And um, so that, um, we haven't got any more questions in the chat at this stage. And um, I wonder whether I might just put out a sort of more general question, uh, Joyce, about your experience through your career and whether you might have any advice to, young scientists at universities like Imperial who are hoping or see themselves moving away from pure science and maybe going into a more policy oriented direction. Um, if, would you have any advice for those people, things they should try and do at this stage of their career? That's a very good question, Ben. So uh, as you know, I started as a lab scientist actually working on virology and here I am now working on environment. So I think depending on one's interest. If I look at my own journey, to be very honest, my scientific foundations and training are still serving me very, very well because science gives you a certain way and framework of looking at things, whether it's depending on data or analyzing uh, deeply uh, different issues. And that is a huge asset in whatever field you choose to do. Now, if you look at most policymakers, they value data, they value science to help inform policy. So as a scientist, you already have a very strong foundation. I think the second point I would add depending on where your interest lies. I mean, if you look at me, I was born and raised in Tanzania, but I went to Scotland, Canada, US, lived in China, South Korea, now I'm in Kenya. And by moving around, by taking informed risks, if you like, I have actually broadened and deepened my understanding of comparative analysis of uh, policy options. I can speak as I did, for example, what happened in Korea and trying to figure out how come Korea advanced so fast compared to Kenya, to, to Ghana or Tanzania, as I mentioned, 1967 per capita. So two, I would really encourage pulling yourself out of your comfort zone. Like Ben, you said you want to do your PhD research in Kenya. That will give you a very, very different uh, perspective when it comes to, aha, uh -huh, this is how Kenya did it. So how can you do it with other countries? So broaden your uh, experience in terms of uh, very different countries, whether it's high income, middle or low, etc. I think three, I would say, continue to be uh, a student. Uh, you know, I promised, uh, I think it was Robin, uh, or somebody that I will go back and study about the scheme that he mentioned. So I've learned complacency is the beginning of stagnation and you should always, always improve yourself and be distinct. Uh, I was reading recently something that Jeff Bezos wrote to the shareholders of uh, Amazon that what makes Amazon as a company unique is the fact that they, they are very distinct and they always try to understand the consumer. So in whatever field you're in, think about how can you raise the bar in terms of your knowledge? So those are the three um, advice that I would give, but definitely the scientific foundations uh, will serve you very, very well, no matter where you choose to go. Thanks. Thank you. 
That's brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Um, really, really helpful. I, I certainly could say that after a, a year of being in London in lockdowns, so I don't need any extra persuasion for going abroad. Um, can't wait to do that. Uh, so that's great. Thank you so much. And um, we do have another question actually that's come in um, through the chat, which I've been asked to uh, read out. Um, and it is from, uh, sorry, one moment. Um, it's from Laura Warwick, who's um, a fellow student, a PhD student here at Imperial. And she says, over the course of your career, what changes have you noticed in how governments and large corporations consider climate change and the environment? From the point of view of the public, it seems uh, that lots of companies have suddenly noticed that climate change is a problem, but I'm sure this hides a lot of hard work behind the scenes. Uh, so thank you. So who asked the question, uh, Ben? Uh, Laura Warwick is her name. Laura. Laura. Thank, thanks, Laura. So um, what changes have I observed? Uh, quite a few, to be honest. I think one is, uh, and I'm generalizing, but obviously uh, when you disaggregate the data, uh, there are some variations. But generally speaking, one is there is more, there is a deeper understanding of the data slash science behind climate change. If you go to uh, most countries, big, small, uh, no matter what the economy, they are aware frankly, as policymakers of the impact of climate change, whether it's because they are seeing oceans or uh, water bodies drying or unusual rainfall, etc. I think the Paris moment also elevated at the very, very high level, uh, the climate change issues, but also determination and will and commitment. So if you look at the story of NDCs, adaptation plans that a number of countries now are actually putting as a core part of development plans. I mean, that's a big, big shift. Uh, three, as the saying goes, uh, charity starts at home and politics are all, somebody told me who is a politician, all politics are domestic because of the awareness of citizens, of voters, young people about climate change and the pressure that they put on politicians, uh, that is also making policymakers uh, responding uh, quite uh, 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 sort of uh, in a positive direction in terms of responding to the citizens. And then lastly, I would argue equally important is the financing that is available for climate change, uh, to support climate change, whether it's the Green Climate Fund, if you look at the Global Environment Facility, if you look at most multilateral development banks, they do have a line uh, if you look at even private banking, some of them have uh, uh, green bonds uh, that are offering. So that also has stimulated uh, private sector engagement in climate change. So there has been uh, progress, at least in, in definitely looking back at the last 20 years plus. Thanks. Thank you, Joyce, and, and thank you, Laura, for your question. It's brilliant. And um, we've got another question uh, in from from Patrick, um, who is my um, fellow organizer for the um, for these seminars. So, Patrick, would you like to ask your question? Uh, thank you very much, Joyce. Um, you made very clearly in your speech that um, our economies are very much embedded and, are in fact, dependent on biodiversity and a healthy environment, and that also quite a lot of the responsibility is going to be on the G20 and high income countries. Uh, to alter their economies to make sure we don't exceed these planetary boundaries but also still provide a social foundation for human well-being um but also alongside this we have two pretty big conferences this year like well um quite massive conferences in the biodiversity and climate change conferences in Kunming and glasgow uh do you also think it's g20 sort of um responsibility because it's going to take a global concerted effort to um combat these um, challenges to help those lower income, income countries and finance them to assist them to reach their targets. Um, and additionally, are there any other sort of outcomes and commitments that you're hoping from uh, from these conferences this year? Uh, thanks. I mean, I think, uh, okay, so G20, because of the size of the economies, uh, the role, and if you look at our emissions gap report, we have a nice chart which actually shows the uh, 
uh, uh, emissions basically coming from different countries. Uh, what I was talking about was setting at the very highest level an example, but also demonstrate leadership, whether it's in addressing the emissions, uh, GSG emissions, but also as part of the policy making uh, body at the uh, at the G20 level. But uh, it's everybody's uh, 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 collective action is absolutely central part of this story. Now, if you're asking me vis-a-vis -vis the financing, when it comes to grant financing and a number of financing mechanisms that go through, say, international financial institutions, definitely G20 carries the biggest weight on that. But having said that, there are uh, some countries that are using innovative. I mentioned Costa Rica, it's a middle income country. It's not um, high income, but they've managed to actually reverse deforestation um, uh, using their own uh, initiatives. So there are certain uh, things that uh, even middle low income countries uh, can actually uh, do. In terms of the two COPs that you are referring to, climate change and biodiversity, I think for the biodiversity, one is the endorsement adoption of the post-2020 biodiversity framework, uh, because the IG targets um, are coming to an end, have come to an end. So uh, I think the expectation and the excitement is actually looking at the new uh, framework. Uh, climate change, given the current geopolitical um, uh, uh, commitment, including uh, from the US as a, a leading uh, country, I think it's, it's exciting. And especially because the UK is the presidency looking at the mix of what will come out on adaptation and mitigation, uh, looking at some of the ideas uh, that may come out um, in terms of stakeholders engagement. I was involved, the UK presidency was here in Kenya for consultations and uh, they met with NGOs, East African NGOs that are based here and there's a lot of expectation, uh, but also there's a reality with COVID-19 pandemic and the recovery, the economic recovery, and most countries are not out of the woods yet. What does um, uh, 2021 mean when it comes to COP26, but also the COP in Kunmin? Um, so I'm looking forward to see what the UK, but also as a global community will come out of climate change. But I think it's also important to think of biodiversity and climate change as two sides of the same coin. And then, of course, we also talk about uh, pollution and chemicals, uh, which again is part of that story. So yes, the two events are important, but also it's important to look at the three as main planetary crises. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, great, thanks very much, Patrick, for the question. Um, we have another question now from uh, one is our Hazan, who is um, a fellow student again on the um, PhD program here at Imperial. Um, would you like to unmute yourself and, and ask your question? Yeah, thank you, Ben. Hi, Joyce. Uh, I'm I'm Wan Izar uh, from Malaysia. Uh, before this, I was working with the government, uh, doing policies. So I'm different, uh, opposite from you, from from science, going to policy. Uh, <laughs> Policy making, but I'm from policy making, uh, doing research, trying to understand how the scientific community think, and um, in order for for me uh, personally to understand how uh, to bridge the gaps between policy makers and the scientific community. So uh, just to re reflect my experience working in Malaysia, we have um, we have a huge gaps with, with regards to policy. We have a very good policy and policy document, but when it comes to translating it into actions at the ground level, local authority level, uh, it is not like uh, uh, it is not uh, happening. I mean, even if it's happened, it does not uh, reflect uh, come up with a, the 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 uh, intent, intended outcome. So um, in this regard, we 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 think that. The gap is on the capacity building uh, because uh, as we uh, move to a four IR, for example, and government invests uh, more on digital transformation, so uh, the chunk of the investment is reduced. I mean, from the government to develop the capacity 
of the leaders, uh, the policymakers, and even the the, the committee uh, leaders. Uh, so uh, how how do you? I mean, if you ever encounter this, how do you like uh, uh, deal with this? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a very good and timely question. You know, if I look at consistent feedback that we at UNEP uh, get from uh, our member states, meaning governments, particularly from low income countries or from developing countries, it's on capacity. Because as you rightly pointed out, uh, we see a number of countries that either have the right policies, but the implementation capacity on the ground is actually lacking. The other aspect that tends to be observed again in developing countries is institutional capacity. Now, Malaysia, uh, I've had a privilege of, uh, even my roommate in Glasgow was actually Malaysian. So I studied a bit in terms of human capital. Malaysia is very rich in human capital, despite the, some of the distribution issues you have. But when it comes to lower level of government, as you rightly pointed out, uh, the issue of uh, weak capacity is there and sometimes disjointed capacity depending on the governance. For example, if you have a country that has a very massive subnational uh, devolution of um, capacity, then it becomes a real challenge. So we, uh, on our part, we do our small part of trying and think innovatively how to help some of these countries improve capacity, for example, through peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning. So like what you're doing, for example, if we have a little bit of grant money through workshops to bring uh, policymakers together, uh, so there would be exchange of information. Uh, unfortunately, unlike other institutions, we don't have scholarships, but I know other institutions do offer scholarships. Uh, we are also seeing uh, domestic capacity building initiatives. I mentioned, for example, uh, one was, uh, I mentioned an entity called African Economic Research Consortium, but really the idea was actually to develop uh, a, a significant uh, number of economists in Africa to actually help implement at the lower level. In ASEAN, uh, I believe I've lost touch, but I think through Singapore, they used to have some capacity uh, building institutions. In my previous job, we used to work with them uh, uh, from Singapore to try and develop lower level capacity. And then we're seeing mayor, uh, for example, in the case of Malaysia, actually, Penang, um, uh, 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 a city, we've actually engaged with some of the mayors in Malaysia to try and get some of the uh, very simple, innovative, domestic um, uh, ideas and solutions and try to bring them to other uh, countries that are not as well endowed as Malaysia. So, but you're absolutely right on capacity, human, but also institutional. And then the other thing is compliance, because um, also that is linked to capacity in, in, in some ways. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Raniza. Um, we have another question now from Fiona Jackson. Um, Fiona, would you like to unmute yourself, please? Hi, uh, yeah, um, just really, uh, I, I live in Scotland um, and we have a community empowerment policy which aims to transform power to communities in order to influence public sector decision making and land ownership. So raising awareness among the public who also have voting power um, on climate change and their nature emergency is really topical for us and is increasingly dominant at the National Park Authority here. Um, however, the subject of broadening out how we measure this health of an economy and the well-being economy is still quite a niche and specialist subject. And so I'm, I work with communities. I'm just wondering if there are any go-to fairly easily accessible fact sheets or resources that we can stimulate like informed community conversations, you know, to enhance understanding and provide maybe practical examples of how actions can be taken from the bottom up by community organizations. Thank you very much, Fiona. Good to see someone from Glasgow. As you know, I spent a three years, I think three and a half years there. 
Um, uh, and uh, well done on the community advocacy. It's extremely important around national parks. On the fact sheets, we don't have them yet, but I'll be more than happy through Ben to inquire if we do or any other organization. We have this um, major publication that came out, Making Peace with Nature. Uh, you've just given me an idea uh, to go back to our technical teams to see uh, if they have any practical examples that have worked at the community level uh, that we could share. Uh, so uh, if we can stay in touch offline, I will get back to you uh, bilaterally. Thank you. Great, thank you. And yes, so just for anyone who who, um, who does want to be in touch with Joyce, if you want to get in touch with me, I'll make sure that that, um, that, that isn't forgotten about and that you're put in touch properly. Um, great. Well, I think, uh, let me see, there may be one more question. No, um, that seems to be all the questions we've got. So um, I think all that's left is for, I'm sure you'll all join me in saying a huge thank you to Joyce for joining us this afternoon. Um, I've certainly uh, really enjoyed it, thought it's been absolutely fascinating. Um, lots to think about, lots of causes for optimism too. Um, so no, it'll be really interesting to see what happens over the next next few years. And I know there'll be plenty of people in the audience who are keen to get involved in this sort of thing themselves. Um, so thank you so much for a, a really yeah, inspiring talk and for answering everyone's questions. Thank you very much, Ben. And thank you to all the participants for a very, uh, very interesting uh, discussion. Very immensely enjoyed it. So many thanks for inviting me and UNEP. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, and we'll have another seminar uh, next month. Um, news about that will be out uh, shortly. Um, so please keep an eye out for that. Um, but uh, in the meantime, thank you all for joining us. Um, thanks again to Joyce. And uh, we'll hope to see you next time. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye.